All right, so today we're going to do our flame test lab. And so Maddie, uh, there's going to be a couple of moments here where we might like, we're going to go outside for a period of time and come back and we're going to be in the back room looking at some stuff. So there'll be some gaps like that where I just can't facilitate that uh, virtually. All right, so just be aware those gaps will happen. Okay. Okay. All right, so on Tuesday, uh, we talked about the emission of light. And if you weren't here, that was our lecture. And so these are the steps or things that happen uh, in an atom for light to be emitted. Okay. And so it's pretty simple. There's just three steps. In some way, shape, or form, an electron in the atom absorbs energy. And Chris, you know, I just want to close your computer so you're not distracted, even though if you're doing science stuff, just you're up here engaged in what's going on. So no matter what kind of energy it is, so when you guys did the Bunsen burner lab, you used heat energy, the flame, right? Caused the metal to glow orange. There were electrons in the, at, in the atoms of the metal jumping up and down like this, giving off orange and yellow wavelengths of light, right? When we were looking at our uh, light bulbs here, uh, there's atoms in the molecules in the gas that are in our fluorescent bulbs here that are moving up and down over and over again, giving off each time, giving off a photon of light. And there's a lot of photons of light coming from the light from the bulbs here. And so today what we're doing is the a flame test lab, and, and we're replicating an experiment done by uh, a famous scientist, Niels Bohr, where he was able to de determine, based off his, his observations, that there is a unique structure about the atom, okay? And so last week, we, we started drawing Bohr models, and this uh, kind of represents a Bohr model, too. And so what he found is that when he burned different elements in a flame, that they each gave off their own different colors of light, okay? And using his understanding and understanding of... Uh, physics, math, and the understanding of atoms at that time, he understood that electrons then must be found at specific energies within the atom. What led him to that conclusion is that light has energy, okay? If you're a, how many of you guys, your parents weld at home, or maybe you've done welding at home, or you're gonna take welding here, you think, when you're in high school, the next four years? Okay, you have to wear long sleeves, not only because it, the sparks are hot and things like that, but what can happen if you weld for a long time with your bare skin? You know, what's that? You can get burned, you'd like literally get sunburned, okay? That's because when you're using a, a welder uh, and you're melting that metal, there's, uh, it's like a white, bright white, uh, light, right? And you, you got to have your welding shield on. And you're giving off uh, UV radiation, okay? So it's beyond visible light, and it's high enough energy, just like from the sun, that you can give you sunburn. So when welders weld, they, they want to, if they're going to weld all day, they, they do this for an occupation, they wear long sleeves, because if they didn't, they would get sunburn all the time, okay? And so... Welding, of course, really hot, a lot of energy. And so before we start today, I want to review something from um, middle school when we talked about uh, how you guys remember the colors of a rainbow and how we can uh, determine the uh, colors of, or determine the energy of uh, the different colors of light, okay? And then what we can do is we can use the different colors to uh, figure out higher and energy light, higher and lower energy light. So back in middle school, what's a saying that you use to remember the order of the colors of the rainbow? Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv. All right. So we got Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, 
orange, yellow, blue, indigo, violet. The G in there, okay? So what I have here is I have uh, three lasers. I've got a red laser, I've got a green laser, and I've got a purple laser or violet laser. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to shine the red laser first. We're going to see what happens. And then I'm going to shine the green laser, it's like in the middle here, see what happens. And then I'm going to shine the uh, UV laser here, and we'll see what happens. Okay. And we're going to use these observations to develop an understanding about the energy of light, okay? Based off of the color. It's this principle that light has energy that leads us to understand why at electrons have specific locations in an atom, okay? All right, so if I shine a red light on here, you're like, is something supposed to happen? No, nothing really happens. It's pretty boring, okay? So now I'm going to use a green laser. So I don't really get a change there. Oh, okay. So this is called fluorescence. So we get something to glow. This would be like using like a black light. Maybe a little bit there, but it's not really strong. And then, oh, that one's pretty bright, okay? So red, we didn't get anything really to happen. Green, we got some things to happen. And now if we use violet, we can get everything to fluoresce, and we can it fluoresces pretty brightly. Okay. And even if I take this glow in the dark hand here, I don't know how well you've seen in the screen, but I can like instantaneously make things that phosphoresce. That means like glow in the dark, like fishing lures and stuff. I can make it glow right away. All right. So, what do you think that means? The trend is for the energy of light as I go from left to right, same Roy G. Biv. Is red a low or high energy light? Low. Low, okay? So going from left to right in Roy G. Biv, I have increasing energy. So if we go back to the simple process for how light is emitted, an electron has to absorb energy, and it has to be enough energy for it to break free. Remember, we have positive and negatively charged particles in an atom. Protons are positive, they're in the nucleus, okay? They're in the center here. And for an electron to break free from its energy level that it's at, it has to have more energy um, than the uh, force that it, the proton is exerting on it, okay, holding it in place. So once it has enough energy, it can break free and go to a higher energy state temporarily. When And the energy it took to break free from this energy level is going to be equal to the energy that's released in the particle of light or photon of light when that electron goes back to its ground state or its original position. So there's a relationship in terms of where the electron is in the atom and the amount of energy it'll give off when it emits light. The closer an electron is to the nucleus or to the protons, it takes more energy to pry it out of there, okay? And the farther away it is, the less energy. So we could infer that um, if it takes more energy or if an electron is located closer to the nucleus, uh, it would give off a higher energy light, like blues and violets or greens, or even x-ray and things like that. And if it gave off uh, lower wavelengths or, or lower energy uh, wavelengths of light, like reds and things like that, that it could be farther away from the nucleus. So it was on this principle that Niels Bohr was able to apply, uh, apply physics and math to describe the internal structure of an atom as having these energy levels, okay? All right, so you guys, when you came to class, you had, uh, you, I asked you to grab these spectroscopes, okay? So we're gonna use those now. So what I want you to do is to pick up your spectroscope. There's a wide end and a narrow end, okay? The wide end is the part that you uh, point at whatever you're gonna look at, and the narrow end is the part you look through. 
You want to hold this with the right side up though. So you have on the wide end, you have a narrow slit, which you want on the bottom. And you have a wide band, vertical band that you want up high, okay? So this is like the sight of like your gun or whatever, uh, this, narrow, this narrow slit here. So whatever light you want to pass through there, to look through the spectroscope, which acts like a prism in that it splits up the light into whatever wavelengths there are, you want that light to pass through this opening, or you want that light to fill this opening here. So what I want you to do is find the nearest light bulb, and I want you to take the brightest part of that light and have it fill up this slit here, okay? And look for the bands of colors, okay? You should see them down below. And Maddie, this is kind of what's happening here. We've got these spectroscopes light passes through here and then inside of them they see these bands of colors okay all right so did you all get a good view of that okay and now what we're going to do is we're going to go outside for a little bit and we're going to uh not look directly at the sun it should be bright enough we want to get a little bit of sunlight and we want that to pass through here okay don't look at the sun at all. And what I want you to do is compare what you saw in here to what you see up here. continuous spectrum and what we saw inside was not exactly this but it's more like that right where we get inside we get bars let's actually draw I'll, I'll draw it up here so we get red orange green turquoise purple okay so inside this is what we see watching at home or watching this later this is what we see in the spectroscopes when we look at a fluorescent light and then when we go outside we don't see these specific bars anymore we see a continuous spectrum like this and so uh, what this tells us is there must be some sort of molecule in here it's some some molecule that has fluorine in it because they're fluorescent bulbs and it has its own unique pattern of light that it gives off, or different wavelengths of light that it gives off. And sci scientists can use these unique patterns of light to identify different compounds or, or elements. Okay? So astronomers can look into space and they can identify different molecules that are on different planets. Okay. Yeah. Pass it over. All right, there we go. Okay. You get it at the end of the day because you're a freshman. You got to learn your lesson. Okay. okay. At the end of the day, you go to the office and Miss Helgen will give it to you. All right. Right, because we got school starting full time in a week now, so we got to get used to the rules and all the speed on that. No distractions like phones. All right. Okay. So astronomers can look into space with a telescope. 
the telescopes are actually on satellites, okay? Because then we don't have to look through the atmosphere. We can just, there's no real interference. And we can look at planets and other galaxies and determine the composition of their atmospheres or what, the, what they're made out of based off of the colors of light given off. Because it turns out every single element, every single compound has its own unique wavelengths of color or light that they give off. And just like you can blend colors of paint to make a different color, you can, bet, you can combine wavelengths of light to give you your own unique colors. Okay? So we're going to go to the back of the room and see that. So we're going to uh, do this. We're going to look at different um, elements and compounds in the gaseous form. We're going to run electricity through this tube, and it's going to make it glow different colors. We may see like a pink color, but that pink color is going to be a combination of like blue, greens, reds, yellows, all those combined to make the uh, pink color that we see in the tube. We'll be able to see the individual wavelengths because we're using a spectroscope that, split, that splits up that color into all the wavelengths that make it up. Okay? So, I want you guys to gather in the back of the room where that blue... Uh, Here's I do. So we see it's like a pink color. And now what you're going to do is you're going to, you have to get about like at, at least this close to it. And you're going to take your little uh, sight here and you want to have this whole like band of light completely fill up that space. And okay? you want as much of that light to come in. So yeah, so you guys are kind of like pictures. You can go up there and like carry it or whatever. What, what colors do you guys see? Blue, green, hot, no, red. Great. So they're all, and they're all unique bands, right? So scientists could take, you know, take this, we look at this uh, poster over here. You, just different shades of blues and reds and yellows all have their own different, slightly different wavelengths, okay? And so scientists can. Um, organize them by the different wavelengths or measure their different wavelengths and then use those unique barcodes of light to identify um, what elements or what things like that would be in a planet's atmosphere. Um, this is also used, a flame test, and more specifically, like we're going to do today, is used to um, identify heavy metals that might be in soil. So in urban development, you may have had like an industrial park or something like that. But now the city is growing and we want to make it a residential area. So what they would do is once they've torn down all of the uh, industrial buildings is they have to do some soil testing to make sure there's no like mercury or extra lead in the places where people want to build their houses, right? Because then that stuff accumulates in your body. You wouldn't want people living there where there's all sorts of mercury because that gives people uh, cancer and diseases, okay? Here's another one, helium. I think this one's a really cool one. You get lots of colors and they're really bright. All right, is this the more, more dramatic one? Yeah, it's a lot of colors. Yeah. You know? Yep, yeah, that's the one. Okay, so uh, every element, every compound, all has its unique barcodes of colors that you can use to identify it, all right? If you knew a lot about physics and math, you'd be able to uh, use those bands and um, their wavelengths to describe where it's specifically an electron is inside an atom based off of the energy of the light and you, you would be able to calculate how much or what energy level it would be on, okay? 
And did it go from like the first ring to the third ring or the first ring to the second ring, first ring to the fourth ring, each of those different transitions, they're called, would give off a different energy light and different color of light. Okay? So the redder the light, the lower the energy, the more blue or violet, purple the light, the higher the energy. That directly relates to the location of the electron inside the atom. And there's a limited number of possibilities of uh, energies, so we can describe the exact locations of an electron using the energy of light. Okay? And now what we're going to do is we're going to move on to our lab. All right? So if you uh, would, just put your spectroscopes back in the bin, and we'll transition to uh, how to do our flame test lab. Marley. Okay. So uh, whether you're doing this virtually or you guys are here, uh, your lab is going to be in the same spot. You don't need to go get it right now. Just follow along with um, what we're doing. So it's in our unit folder, Atomic Theory. And then you can either get it in the Assignments folder or uh, go to today and open it up here. Now, something not to forget when you leave here is where to find the information you need for answering your post lab questions. Okay, your actual assignment is down is going to be down here, and the information that you need to help you answer your post lab questions, like identify the um, element based off of the color of the flame, is going to be embedded here when you open up your assignment in Schoology. Okay. So don't forget that this information is here. There's also um, information on here about the different products given off um, in a combustion. Remember we talked about, or I guess we don't need that. That was from last week. About combustion reaction, we need that. Um, but there's other information here about uh, the emission spectrum and things like that. Most importantly though is this table. Uh, you guys are gonna reference to identify the different elements. And just because there's an element on here doesn't necessarily mean that it's in your samples, but I will say that most of them are, okay? But there's a couple elements that are in this list that aren't in there. So no food jack or anything, yep. All right. We got lunch coming up, right? You'll survive. Yeah. Can't wait for lunch. Yep, favorite part of the day. All righty. So, uh, the part that you actually fill out, though, is going to be this table. So the instructions are embedded separately from uh, the assignment part that you do. So at five lab stations are sample sets of the different salts that you're going to test. So you guys know salt as what? What's the scientific name for table salt? Nope. Sodium chloride, okay? So that means it's made out of a sodium and chloride atom. And so salt, that name is actually a term for, in chemistry to describe that a substance is made out of a metal and a non-metal. Sodium is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal. Our next unit is the uh, going over the periodic table. Non-metals are on the right-hand side. They make a small proportion of it. Metals are take up three quarters of the periodic table. They're all over here. Sodium chloride. Okay. Every salt that we're going to be using today is some combination of a metal and a non-metal. Okay. All right. So we have these different salts here, and some of them are much more distinct from one another than the others. Okay. So for instance, these two have their own unique colors, and they're easy easy to distinguish. However, there's other salts in here that look really similar to one another. Like all of these are white. Okay? But they have different textures. So if I'm going to compare 
what I need to do before I start the lab is describe the uh, different salts, okay? So if I take these two, for example, these look like it's F and C, I can see that they have different textures to them, okay? And to help you think of like how to describe these uh, different salts, because they have the same color, is think of um, things that you have in your kitchen. So we have like flour, powdered sugar, salt, sugar, sea salt, things like that. So if I were to look at these two samples, this one kind of has the texture of flour, right? And this one kind of looks like salt or sugar, right? So you can use those kinds of descriptions to distinguish one salt from another, okay? Make sure that for every one of your samples that you, you provide a different description. Don't just say like white crystal. Make sure each description is different from the other. So you need to do that part first before you move on to the, the flame uh, portion of the lab, okay? So once you've described all the different samples, it goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. So I think that's nine samples. Uh, then you can move on to the flame uh, portion of the test of the lab. Before you do that portion, you need to make sure that you are wearing your goggles, goggle cabinets over under the American flag over there. And at the center of the room, we're gonna have these uh, wooden splints that have been soaked in water. Why do you think they're soaked in water? We're doing a flame test. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, dip this water-soaked wood splint into each of the different sample vials, okay? And what we're trying to observe is the excitement of electrons just in the salt and not the burning of the wood, right? Because we're going to see different colors. We don't want to see the burning of the wood. We want to see what color these different salts give off, okay? We're going to use those colors to identify whatever metal is in it. All right? So I'll get my burner going here. Turn off the lights. So we're going to take our uh, wood splint. You guys are going to do this one at a time because it's important that this has a lot of water on it so the salt sticks to it. So you're just going to do this one sample at a time. I'll leave the wood splints in the uh, middle of the room. So you're going to... Probably not going to work very well. You're just going to take your wood splint like a dipstick, like that candy you can get at the gas station. Get some of the salt onto the wood splint, and then you can place it in the fire, okay? So each of these is going to give off its own unique colored light. And that's what's gonna go in the next column where it's the flame description, okay? If you leave this in here long enough, then the water is, is all turned to steam, and you start burning the wood, and you'll get the yellow color, okay? If you do this, and you notice that the uh, flame stays. I guess I can't get get mine to do that. Cricket to do that. Sometimes you get some of the crystals fall off. Salt crystals fall off your wood splint, and they stay on the rim of the burner, and like your flame would stay green like this. If that happens, use your wood splint to kind of 
scrape out or pop out that uh, piece of uh, the salt crystal. So now I've got a glowing ember my wood flint. Get to your lap, I get to your lap station, you should have a beaker with water, and uh, when you're done with your wood splint, you put it into your beaker here, okay? So, we're doing a flame test lab. We're not uh, burning our wood splint, so just stay focused on what we are doing in the lab, um, and, and um, don't put your pencils or any other uh, things like that into the fire, okay? So, um, when you guys are finished with the lab, you're going to have a bunch of um, charred wood splints in here. And what you're going to do is just take the wood splint, throw them in the garbage, dump out your water, and then fill it back up. Comes out fast, so don't just crank on it. And then leave it set up for the next group. Also, when we're in lab, it's important that we clean up our lab station before we're done. While we're doing hybrid and stuff, I'm kind of leaving the equipment out on the table to maximize the amount of time you guys have to do this stuff. When we get back to class uh, in a week or so, or a week here, February 1st, you guys will be putting the equipment back away in the cabinet when it's time to do the lab and get it out of the cabinet. Part of that, though, is to clean up your lab station. So in doing this lab, you're going to have some leftover ash or salt as that kind of sprinkled onto the countertop. So you need to move everything out of the way, take a wet paper towel, Wipe everything down before you leave class today. Okay? But well, you can leave all your lab equipment on your lab station for the next class. Okay? So, um, if you're using your, your burner and it goes out for whatever reason, shut off the gas before you try to relight it. If you're having trouble lighting your burner, what do we want to make sure we hear when we turn on the gas before we try lighting it? We want to hear the gas coming out, okay? So some people yesterday were trying to light it, but they couldn't hear the gas, which means their gas valve wasn't open. And so make sure you check for those kind of things before you uh, start, okay? So when you guys are doing this lab, you'll need your Chromebooks out because that's where you're gonna be putting in all of your information. Remember that when it comes time to doing the post lab questions, that all that information is right here in this table, which you get when you before you open your assignment, but when you access the flame test lab assignment, you're going to reference the information in this table here. So you guys can get into five groups. If there's a person that's by themselves, uh, they can go work at, work at a, another lab station by themselves, but I would like people, no one person to be at a lab station by themselves. So if there's a group of two and a group of one, I'd like that uh, singleton to grab the, that beaker of uh, salts and just bring it over to a lab station that someone else is at. That way, if you don't understand how to do something because you're by yourself, you at least have a couple people around you you can ask or you can at least kind of like look to see what they're doing to keep up with what's going on. Okay. No groups larger than three. So you guys can go ahead and get into five groups. Once you're in your groups, go get your goggles and then you can start the lab. Um, may I actually get into four groups, sorry, because I'm going to keep a sample up here to work with uh, Maddie and Marley. So Maddie and Marley, you guys have your labs open? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I'm gonna, all right, so I'll get set up here, and the first thing I'll do is I'll turn on the lights, and we'll um, describe the different salts, and then I'll turn off the lights, and we'll start doing the flame test part. So as it looks like you guys are finished uh, describing your salts, I'll start turning off the lights, and you guys can... Um, start burning them, to, and I'll turn off the lights. Yeah, if you don't, pro if you don't have a problem working on your own, probably excited to own oh, girl here. <laughs> All right. So, 
Okay. Okay, so this is sample A. And so you could describe these however you want. So it looks like they're kind of like clustered crystals for sample A. Are you guys good? I can move, kind of move on, or are you not quite ready? Marlene. You can move on. Okay. All right. Here's B. Kind of out of focus, but it looks, it has kind of the texture of a uh, flower. If I tip it, it kind of tumbles like flower. It's kind of fine grained. So sample B, like, White white crystals with a flower texture. C could be like uh, it's similar to B. It was more I think it's more kind of like a powdered sugar. Okay. D is a really easy one to distinguish. Uh, blue green crystals. And uh, when you see these in person, if you see them in person, the crystals are kind of long and sharp. Long, sharp, blue green crystals, letter D. Letter E, I gotta go grab one from a lab station. You guys do E already? No. Okay. Look at the bottom. You describe it as like a brown sugar or like a rusty brown. So letter E is wrapped in electrical tape because that salt decomposes in sunlight. So to protect it from breaking down, we wrap it in electrical tape. Okay. So uh, this is letter E, and it has kind of a reddish brown. Uh, color to its crystals. If you want to stay in kitchen descriptions, you could say like brown sugar. Yeah. F. F would be like, I think just plain sugar. G is like, or yeah, G is like a salt, like table salt. And then we have two left, I think, here. So H, this one could be like Himalayan salt. It's got a pink color to it. Himalayan salt's got pink. And then, uh, Marley and Maddie, I have, um, uh, orange salt that's from Hawaii that you use to make like a Hawaiian uh, pork. So, and that comes from like the clay that's that's in the soil where you uh, mine the salt. And same kind of thing with the Him Himalayan salt. There's just some minerals that are in it that give it that pink color. This looks like Himalayan salt, but of course is not it. All right, I've got one left in here to find A C D E F G H I I I I. Go. So I, I uh, see like kind of like a gray, gray sugar-like crystal. So one of the other samples was like a normal white sugar-like. This one's a little gray. Looks a little like dirty sugar. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna run through our samples and people are starting to uh, get ready to light up their burners. So I'll shut off the lights and we'll go through the samples. Once we've done that part, you'll have all the information you need to finish the rest of your lab.
Remember, turning the barrel changes the color and temperature of the flame. You're supposed to be some uh, meat. Yep, so in the bottom, if you look at the bottom, you see like a brown. Yep. Okay, and then so we want our flame about three to four inches tall, or two to three inches tall, two distinct cones. We change the height by changing the amount of gas it's getting. We change the color of it by changing the amount of oxygen it's getting by turning the barrel. All right. So Marley and Maddie, I'm going to find letter A here. Then I have the wood splints up at the front of the desk here as you need them. Okay, so here goes letter A. Ooh. Oh, it looks orange, but this and in, in, um, on the camera, but it is red in uh, in person. Let me look at an orange red. I'm going to do something here. I'm going to try moving back the camera, and maybe it won't be so bleached out. So if you're describing the flame, I'd say like an orange red. Yeah, it looks like it, on the camera it looks still orange, but in real life it looks like it's like a pink red kind of like salmon tangerine color. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to sample B. If I if you need me to pause or something like that, you just let me know. Okay, I'm gonna do letter B now. So B has an orange flame to it, kind of a, a, a dull orange, dull orange. Can you get different, uh, a different one for each of the flames, right? Yes, yep. Okay. Yeah, we grab a fresh, a fresh splint every time. Yeah. All right. So. You just grab one at a time. Oh, keep it wet. Yep, just one at a time. Okay. Yep. Okay, now we're going to do letter C. Okay, so this is more of a, a brighter orange than the other one. Now I'm just burning the wood. So we had a dull orange for B and a brighter or bright orange for C. D is the one that I demonstrated at the beginning. This gives a co really cool flame. This is a bright green color, and then it turns into blue. So you say green, blue, and then actually it uh, you get some sparks in here of white. So this is green and blue. You get to, it looks like you get to kind of see it if I don't make it too bright. Right. 
Letter E, I gotta go. Com I'm gonna go commandeer from another group here. I'll be back. Okay, so here's letter E. E has some sparks that fly off it. It's like a sparkly gold, golden flame. That's done now, but it's, E is like sparkly golden. F. This is like a pink color, pink and blue. Kind of like uh, if you ever lit your marshmallow on fire in the pink flame that you get from burning your marshmallow, that's what this looks like, like a pink and blue color. If you can relate to a marshmallow flame, you could say pink, blue, kind of marshmallow flame. And we got letter G here. Ooh, G's got a very red color. This is a deep, a really bright red. So I think you have crimson, which would be the darker red, and this would be the brighter red in, in your T. This one's definitely uh, bright. I put bright red for this one because I think that matches one of the metal descriptions. Your other red one would have been like a, the crimson color. There we go. All right. That's that one. Uh, that was G, and now we're on to H. This is the one that looks like Himalayan salt. I'm having a little bit of trouble getting the crystals to stick to it, so I'll keep working on that. Yeah, this one's really sparky. So we had that earlier one that's sparky. This one's way more sparky. And it has kind of a yellow flame with lots of sparks. And then there's some hints of green. Yellow flame, lots of sparks, and there's uh, hints of green in there too. Kind of yellow green. So that was letter H. So now we're on our last one here. Okay, this is I. Okay, this is like a yellow orange. So we had two oranges that look pretty similar. I described one as being like lighter and I think one being darker. This is distinctly like yellow, much more yellow than it is orange flame. This is letter I. Okay, so Maddie and Marley, that's all of the samples. And so now, um, as best you can from those observations, you're going to look at the uh, table from the instructions. Let me open up the assignment and school with you.
and uh, use that table to now identify, try to identify what metal uh, each letter vial had in it based off of the flame color and then answer the four five questions after that. Are you guys good to go? Marley and Maddie? Yeah. Hey? Marley, do you have any questions? No. All right, so I'm going to stop recording this and I'm going to work on getting this published so it's available for the next hour. Yeah. 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 Y